A warm good morning, uh, good morning to all the participants. It's a great privilege for me to introduce today's speaker. First of all, I would like to thank uh, students, staff, management of Bapatla College of Pharmacy for giving this opportunity to act as a coordinator for this uh, ACT-sponsored uh, second day program. So let me introduce today's speaker. She is a multi-talented, multidisciplinary, integrative, versatile person. It's none other than Pail Chatterjee. She is carrying out uh, her PhD. She is a research scholar, expected to be uh, graduated by May 2022. She is doing her PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences, School of Pharmacy, University, Maryland, Baltimore. She did her MSc, Pharmaceutical Science, from School of Pharmacy, Western University of Health Sciences, Punama. Her area of uh, research interest is deep learning based optimization of. Leonard Jones poly, uh, parameters for charms polarization force field for small molecules. She also interested in carrying out research on structural activity relation and design of novel beta epoxy morphinon analogs as a selective micron receptor antagonist using the site identification. So she is carrying out her uh, research activities in collaboration with the uh, Macro Lab and uh, Leo Labs. She is having a vast command over various software skills. She has uh, having international publications, eleven international publications, and uh, uh, different honors. She has presented more than. Six papers. Her academic excellence sounds great. She achieved bronze medal for third highest score in graduation class 2009 from when the from Bengal University of Technology, Calcutta, for being the second highest scorer, the degree of Master of Pharmacy in Pharmaceutical Chemistry. She crowned grown medal for best uh, all-rounder, for best all-rounder for academic, as well as extracurricular activities. She has been having a great honors and awards she achieved uh, Department Merit Award for 21, uh, 2021 and 22 from Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Maryland. She also received an award from Roche Honors Society Merit uh, Reward for the academic year 2018 and 19 for pursuing doctoral degree of University of Maryland. With this brief note, I hand over my session to today's speaker, Paul Chatterjee. Ma'am, good morning, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such a great uh, introduction. Um, it really boosted my confidence as I'm like, fine in the final moments of my PhD, submission of my PhD, so <laughs> really needed. <laughs> So today I will be um, talking about, um, so I'm basically a drug designer. 
And what I do yeah, is yeah. I use computer aided drug design. Um, my PhD topic is something Hello, very different. I actually work on uh, creating the environment Can in computers know? for small molecules. Can you hear me? Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, can you give one minute? Let me introduce uh, Mr. Priyanka, ma'am. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Let, go, go ahead, go ahead. That. So, good morning, ma'am. So, along with you, we, wish, we would like to invite Priyanka Kunamanini to this session. So, our, our Priyanka Kunamanini is a pharmaceutical scientist with about eight years of pharmaceutical research experience, including pre formulation, formulation, novel drug delivery, process development, innovation processes, regulatory filling, analytical method development and validation, purchase, GMP, FDA. ICH, USP, global filings. She had got her Master of Science in Pharmaceutical Sciences, Western University of Health Sciences, Pomona, California, USA during the year 2015 to 2017. She had got Bachelor of Pharmacy from Usmania University, Hyderabad. She is currently working as a research scientist in Brown Medical Inglutu, California from October 2017, she worked as a faculty assistant in the Western University of Health Sciences, Pomona, California from August 2015 to July 2017. She worked as a third cadre officer in regulatory affairs in the Medrich Limited, Bangalore, India in the period of October 2012 to June 2013. She worked as an officer in formulation R&D Asian Drug Research Solutions Private Limited, Hyderabad, in India from September 2010 to April 2012. She acted as a trainee in the NATCO Drug Research Center, Hyderabad, during June 2009 to December 2009. She is having an experience in the formulation and analytical development of small molecules and peptide, performing and guiding POP studies for identified lead molecules in available containers, using innovative techniques such as calorimeter to determine the compatibility of the drug with packing materials to predict the kinetics and stability of the drug product. We are very much pleased to have you both today on the screen, ma'am. Thank you for a warm uh, welcome, ma'am. It's my honor to be here. Though I don't have any presentation, I'm still here. I have some interest in knowing different uh, cross-functional topics. Thanks for a great introduction. Okay, ma'am. Chetaji, ma'am, you can start your presentation. Okay, I will start. So, what I was saying is, um, I'm working as on this side project other than my PhD, and it's based on drug design. So, um, the topic for the the title for the project is avoiding side effects and improving specificity and efficacy of novel mu opioid receptors. Uh, agonists guided by site identification by ligand competitive saturation. So site identification by ligand competitive saturation, it's a software. You can say it's a drug designing software. And uh, my PhD supervisor is personally uh, vested in this, in this company Silks Bio. He's the chief scientific officer for it. And I was working uh, on the site project as a part of it. So basically we are trying to design uh, newer molecules or uh, which are morphine analogs and bind to mu opioid receptors. So uh, the first thing that I would like everyone, all of you to know is of course, um, opioids are alkaloids or alkaloid drugs. Uh, commonly uh, we know morphine, codeine, thebane, and then we have been introducing a number of uh, alkalo opioid alkaloids into the market. The reason being that uh, they are also known as the holy grail of medicine. And why so? Because uh, the kind of anti nociceptive action they show, that the kind of uh, pain killing action they show is not achieved by, from the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or even the steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So the thing with them is, uh, what, is the, what, what, what is the big deal? 
with um, opioid alkaloids. So the thing with them is um, they are widely prescribed for uh, chronic and severe pain. For example, in the United States, they are uh, prescribed a lot as a prescription drug uh, in cancer pain, uh, in accidental pains, and also for traumatic brain injury. Uh, when you know soldiers go to wars and they come back uh, with amputative, uh, amputated uh, body parts, that's when uh, opioids are required for killing the pain. So, uh, however, despite all these benefits of opioids, the biggest risk of opioids is their overdose and addiction. And the side effects caused by uh, opioids are enormous. They they in, uh, are, are supposed to form like a tolerance due to which addictive behavior arises in patients and then the patient never gets off of the drug. And basically this has been causing a lot of problems uh, in the United States, which is the worldwide is known as the opioid crisis. So in this, uh, on the right-hand side, I'm just showing a picture uh, of a woman and this is a real life picture of a woman. Uh, she started taking drugs in 2010 when she was prescribed on opioids. And after four years, this is what how she looks like. So basically it not just uh, affects your daily functional activity, but also your entire body, uh, which has been causing 50,000 deaths uh, from drug overdose in the United States, according to the CDC. And the CDC also estimates that the economic burden um, of opioid drugs is around 78.5 billion a year, which you can understand is like a lot of, it's a big burden on the economy uh, of not just America, but also other countries. And like in most part of the Europe, Netherlands and so on. So roughly 21 to 29% of the patients uh, who are prescribed of opioids misuse them. So yes, the drug, the drug addicts that we have, all this economic burden is coming from the prescription drugs. So what do we do? As scientists, what is our responsibility? Can we design better opioid agonists? Let's look at uh, the whole problem. So first of all, uh, I would like to tell you what are opioid receptors. Of course, uh, as most of you know, these are like the transmembrane receptors, which, uh, which are also known as in the, the six helical uh, transmembrane receptors. They sit right in the membrane, and that's why transmembrane name comes from. This is a picture on the left-hand side. It's, a, it's an image um, I have picked up from the crystal structure paper, which was published in Nature back in 2012. Uh, for this mu opioid receptor, 5C1M active form. And what it shows you is that you can clearly see all the six helices that I was talking about that sits in the membrane. And along with that, um, you can see that they, these are labeled ECLs and ICLs. And what that means is like, whatever surface of the receptor which faces the extracellular site um, are known as the extracellular loops and whatever is sitting inside are known as intracellular loops. So what happens is when a drug comes uh, uh, from the outside, it, it just sits on it, it binds it, binds to the receptor, and then a cascade of signal transduction mechanism starts from here. So basically uh, the drug binding to it, and then because it is a G protein coupled receptor, most of the things like mo most of the binding is uh, related to the G protein. And once the G protein is bound, uh, it blocks adrenal cyclase, uh, it uh, enhances uh, the ion channels, and then arrestin comes and binds to it. So what part of this signal transduction mechanism causes tolerance? Uh, right here, internalization. So this is one of the well-known theories uh, of why drug tolerance is caused. Um, and it, it just says, it just means that once, the, once you have enough drug in, in the cells, what happens is the cell bound to the, pro, uh, the ligands uh, bound to the proteins, they are internalized. They are lysosized by uh, little cysts inside the cells. So there can be two things that can happen. One is uh, either they de are degraded by the lysosomes or they are recycled back to the membrane. So this part, 
the recycling back part to the membrane. So once they are lysed, once they are encapsulated, uh, the cells get a signal that there is not enough drug and they need more. That's what causes the addiction. And the, the, this gap period is what causes the addiction. But when later on it finds more drug, it releases or recycles back to the membrane. And that's what causes overdose. So these, this is basically the, the, the signal transduction mechanism and this is how it works. So now uh, that we know this, uh, what we are interested in looking at is my project was basically, um, I had a collaboration, we had a collaboration with the University of Wisconsin uh, with, with uh, Dr. Christopher Kenningham. And he was, uh, what he did was he synthesized a bunch of ligands uh, known as 7E benzylidine oxymorphone compounds. Basically any compound with, uh, with this oxymorphone uh, scaffold. Uh, I see a lot of people waiting in the waiting room, actually. Um, so yeah, this, this oxymorphone is, you, you can say something is oxymorphone when it has this morphone group and it's like oxy. So we call it the, the BOM scaffold. So there are two things going on in here. Basically, this is the part, the R group, which is positively charged. It's a basic amine. Being a positively charged uh, part of the ligand, it binds to this product acid, uh, amino acid, uh, residue ID 147 of the receptor, active receptor. And it is so close to it that it just binds to it and then uh, activates the protein by opening or closing the, open, uh, the, the tunnel. Now I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a minute by showing you uh, the actual GUI of it. But the basic thing is that we have two parts where we can target. One is altered here for selectivity, which is known as the message. Once it binds to the aspartate, it, uh, it sends a message to the aspartic acid, and then that opens up the protein uh, pocket a little bit where this uh, part of the ligand fits in and alters. In, and if you, it's known that if you alter the if you want to alter the efficacy or selectivity or avoid the side effect, this is the part that you need to change. So um, our um, collaborator changed and he, he this part, he altered this part and gave us like, a, like 21 ligands uh, to test. And he asked us to uh, tell them uh, where these compounds bind before they could do like a cell uh, study, cell-based study. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, the protein up in here in a bit, but first I will show you, um, the, first I will talk about the background of uh, it more, the background of the process. So basically silks, uh, it's an application or structure-based drug design approach. There are very well-known uh, structure-based drug designing approaches. And why I am showing uh, this funnel is because um, in the top of the funnel, you can see that uh, this is the most virtual library. This is the most widely used uh, form of um, drug designing approach, in silico drug designing approach used around the world. And uh, why? what these two arrows are showing you is their usage or like speed and accuracy. So if you come down the funnel, accuracy improves. But if you go up the funnel, speed improves. So for virtual library, it's the fastest, uh, followed by molecular docking, which is less faster than virtual library. And then there are high uh, like conceptual based methods like molecular mechanics, GVSA, which is the generalized bond surface area basically takes into account the electrostatic and the non-electrostatic approaches. After followed by that is the free energy perturbation, which I will talk about in a little bit. But first of all, virtual library, you, you all uh, of you might have seen uh, like the screening of the compounds, which are well known in COVID-19 uh, during this whole pandemic. What basically every pharmaceutical company was doing is trying to uh, repurpose the drugs that are already there in the market. And why so? Because in a short time, that's the best option we have. We need to rely on approved and synthetically accessible drugs. 
So what they did was they literally looked at a virtual library, screened millions of compounds already existing, approved by the FDA, to see if something fits that inhibits COVID uh, the COVID uh, receptor capsid protein. So that's one method, but that's very cheap. Uh, cheap is in the sense that it doesn't take a lot of time, or um, uh, but it also doesn't ha also have accuracy because you can you can look at the compounds and you can make a guesswork whether it'll work or not, or you can secondly as in molecular docking you can dock them on like a static. Uh, protein surface, but the protein surface, the changes in the protein surface is not going to tell you anything. And that's what molecular docking does. It tells you a lot of, gives you a lot of information, but only for if you want to eliminate certain compounds, only if you want to know which one is better and which one is not. But for better information, you need to see what is the binding efficacy of the drug to the protein. And for the, those methods, you need to apply free energy approaches, which tells you the Gibbs free energy of the compounds. Now coming to Gibbs free energy, uh, we, know, uh, we know that um, the free energy, so free energy perturbation is a method where basically what we do is we perturb a part of the ligand to see if that part of the ligand is actually contributing to the free energy or binding affinity. So in, in short, we know that the binding affinity of a small molecule, also known as KD, we know the KD, we can calculate KD in uh, cells because we know the concentration of the ligand, we know the concentration of the protein, and then we also know how much ligand is bound to how much protein, which is the protein ligand complex. We know the concentration, we can find out the KD. Now from the KD, we can define or we can derive the delta G binding. Delta G binding is, the free energy gives free energy of binding. How? But we just take the you know, minus KT, natural log of KD divided by the concentration, which is the standard state concentration. Now we can do this. We can calculate it. And how we do that in uh, computers is when we find, uh, we find out the delta G. So basically, this approach, what it does is, as I said, if I have my ligand and this is the part I want to alter, then I will disappear it little by little. And at each state, I will find out the delta G binding. So if this is state A and this is state B, then I will first found, find out the delta G state of state A. And then in second, I will find out the delta G of state B. And then I, for the relative binding free energy, I will subtract it and see how much contribution is this part giving me. That's what free energy perturbation is. But free energy perturbation take, takes a long time and a lot of computational needs. Because we need to simulate the protein in solvents for a very long time. And by very long time, I just mean one microsecond. Google had been able to simulate one microsecond using their enormous computational power. And that's the only uh, one millisecond, sorry, by using their enormous computational power. And that's the only one millisecond simulation that is available. Normally, labs, common labs like ours, we can do like, one microsecond, 10 microsecond, 20 microsecond simulations. And that too, I'm talking about supercomputers thrown in together with like hundreds of cores of machines. And that's when we are able to do it. So this is obviously not achievable by each and every company, uh, especially the smaller startups. So this is why, and this is where uh, uh, we can use something like site identification by ligand competitive saturation. Now, uh, since I'm talking about GBCR, I'm showing you the workflow of how I worked uh, with this. So you, I basically took the uh, mu opioid receptor crystal structure, and then I prepared my system. First thing is I solvate it. Uh, so why solvation? Because water is the commonest solvent present inside our body. So we, as in computers, if you want to do molecular dynamics, you have to throw it in water. But then this, this protein is a transmembrane receptor. So this black patch you see here, it is the lipids, the phospholipids that is sitting in there. So I put it in a bilayer, lipid bilayer, and my calculations and measurements are done properly to make sure that the crystal structure is not destroyed. And then I keep it, I keep the crystal structure water too. And then I simulate 10 into 100 nanosecond each simulation 
using a grand canonical Monte Carlo approach. Now, grand canonical Monte Carlo approach is basically if you have, imagine if you have a protein, you put it in the beaker and you put a solvents in the beaker. And if you put the solvents, the solvents will bind somewhere in the protein. And if they bind somewhere, then you come to know where do they bind. And so after a certain time, you will be able to access the concentrations or the occupancy of these solvents. And that's what these colors shows. And these are known as frag maps. You can use those frag maps to give your ligand a score. If you, if you now dock your ligand to the protein, which is flexible, you will see that the ligand also sits somewhere. And if those frag maps overlap with your ligand, then you will be able to tell what part of the ligand is actually getting a good score on the basis of the overlap or the occupancy. Now, this will make more sense if I just share uh, something with you. I have pulled up. Can everybody see uh, my screen? Yes. Okay, so I have pulled up the G yes, protein no, have... receptor here. And uh, what I did was, um, this is my protein. I had after simulation and this, this colored maps or grids are the frag maps. So this is after uh, one microsecond of simulation, just 10 into 100 nanoseconds. And then what happens is you see there is, um, there is like a light blue color. And this, these are different types of maps. So maps are, as I said, they are different types of solvents. So what I'm showing you here is that you can see, you can categorize those solvents into if they are apolar or not, if they are generic donor, if they are generic acceptor, if they have a benzene in their ring, if they have propanes in their rings, the green colors are all the propane maps. I can turn them off and on. And the benzenes are also dark green in color. Um, and then I have methanol oxygen map, formamide map. And the most important map here is methyl ammonium map. So methyl ammonium map. Why methyl ammonium map? Because remember, I showed you that my ligand has a positively charged N, N plus H part. And that's what I said, it binds to this part. Now, if I show you, that's my aspartate. Uh, let me color it. Oh, I guess it takes a long time. Oops. Sorry about that. Yeah. So this is the aspartate. You can see it has COO minus. So COO minus, if my protein, if my uh, ligand comes and sits here, it will be overlapping with this part, which is the methyl ammonium. Now methyl ammonium is basic amine, basically. So you have a positively charged center you have a negatively charged amino acid. And what you know is what this tells you is that it is pointing out the exact location of where your ligand should be binding, right? And that's why you're, if, you're, if you dock a number of compounds, so we got from our collaborators 20 dif different ligands and we docked them in here using Monte Carlo sampling. Now, once we did that, we got a score and that score is known as ligand grid free energy. Now that free energy is because whatever, uh, so we compare each occupancy of the each of the atom sitting in the grid. Now, what I'm talking about is, I'll share the screen back. Uh, so moving fast forward, if this was, so what is ligand grid free energy? Now, if I have the maps, how I have got them is I have created a grid on them. And then now this grid, you see they are occupying, these maps are now occupying the parts of the grid. 
depending on how much part of the grid they are occupying with the occupancy ratio divided by the bulk occupancy ratio that normalized we get like a grid, grid free free energy score and if our ligand is sitting on like four or five of these grids then each of them will get a score just like this if my ligand is sitting here 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 of course it cannot sit because it's outside so here if it is sitting then it will get a full score and that will form its ligand grid free energy for example now in this in this diagram what i'm showing is this is the crystal ligand and the crystal ligand was sitting it was pro crystallized and this part was sitting near the aspartate uh, residue that i'm showing here you see it got a very good score it got a score of negative 2.6 kilocalorie now in reality the in experimental studies the binding affinity of this total drug is negative 5 kilocalories from where only 3 negative 3 kilocalories is coming from just this part as you can see this is the basic amine and which really pinpoints where your uh, ligand should be sitting so that's a part it's a kind of a structure activity relationship kind of a study where you can actually score or tell which parts are good and which parts are giving you more penalties this red red numbers are all penalties and which parts are going to give you which part of the ligand are going to give you a good score on the basis of that you can then modify now as as you see the crystal structure ligand we see like these all parts these three atoms gave a good score but then for somehow these parts are not good this is this this part is not good so benzene is probably not a good choice for this ring and we might need to change it we might need to uh, modify it so what we did was um, as you can see this is uh, the mu opioid binding pockets and this is actually a picture from uh, the a paper i have submitted to journal of american chemical society uh, you can see so basically i did like both active and inactive receptor so both the receptors uh there is a well known difference between the receptors because we know that the inactive pocket is very big so that the ligand sits there but doesn't bind to the aspartic acid residue never so this is particularly captured in my uh, project where i saw like a lot of you see the methyl ammonium maps in the active site is sitting near the aspartic acid residue where here it's all over the place here it will sit but it will get a penalty instead because it is disoriented uh from far away from the amino acids that are actually required so basically we found these sites and we found the uh we found uh, a number of ligands and and we could directly point point which one of them are going to have a good score and which of one of them are not going to have a good score so the message address concept that i'm talk that i was talking about that this nr1 is the message while r2 is the address just like takes the signal transduction forward is what we also saw in uh, the ligand binding poses that we got so in the poses that we got you see uh, the r2 part is sitting at the a polar side and the r1 part is sitting near, which is the key side is sitting near the spot 8147 residue so that's one thing and this is the difference between uh we so we dock the ligands both in um, active and inactive receptors i cannot show you the structures uh, because it's a, it's a proprietary copyright i i mean it's basically it will be revealing the uh, structures of the drugs that's why i can't show you but i can show you the the r squares so this is a pretty good r square now you would say that it's 0.58 it's not that good but it's a pre pretty good r square given that it's such a preliminary uh, part of the research right now and we are taking it forward we um, uh, the our collaborators the medicinal chemists they will uh, we have given them a couple of suggestions they will be working on and we this paper is under uh, publication right now on the other hand if you dock the same ligands in the inactive you get nothing like no binding which is what is uh, seen uh, in the experiment as well and the ranks of the ligands were very well uh, replicated from the experiments when they were tested on hamster ovarian cells uh, on the active mu opioid receptors 
So the conclusion um, is that uh, we got a pretty good ligand grid free energy scores obtained from our approach and they were systematically correlated with their experimental binding Gibbs free energy. And um, also the message and address uh, sites were very well correlated. They were, and there was a good uh, overlap with the silks uh, maps, frag maps. And these, this study reveals important details related to the SAR, SAR of the type of the ligands that we are using here in the drug design part. And these are the references for the method that we had been using. Yes. Thank you. And I can answer any questions you guys would like to ask me. So if the participants are having any doubts, you can ask directly to ma'am. Sorry? If there are any queries, I'm asking you um, them to post in the chat box as we can. I cannot hear you somehow. So my volume is only 30%. I can't increase it. Can you say that again, ma'am? I'm asking the participants if they're having any queries, they can ask you, ma'am. That's Oh, it. okay. The queries can also be posted in the chat box. Yeah. Is someone interested in um, drug design here? Ma'am, there's a question in the chat box. What are the reliable free softwares available? How a person can get to identify the drug receptor binding? Free softwares. Um, you can use, uh, actually, Silks Bio is also like, you can use the academic version if you request for it. And Schrodinger, I know Schrodinger also gives you um, a student trial version. For example, the software that I was using, it is from Schrodinger. I was using Pymo and I did not buy it. I Basically, I am on a student trial version. And once it expires after 30 days, you can activate again using your email ID, uh, college email ID. So that's how it works. Secondly, you can use many, uh, like there is Mole Pro and there's other softwares that are for free. There are multiple softwares for free for drug design you can use. And if you want to uh, really um, like delve deeper into molecular dynamics, then it is all softwares are free. All you need is a computer. It will work a little slow, but you can also um, you can also work with it. It's it's pretty much doable. Are there any other questions? Uh, 
So the participants are asking your mail ID as they can contact you any time if they are having any doubts. Yeah, sure. Uh, please feel free to. Uh, uh, share my information. I'll be I'll be glad to answer your questions. Okay, ma'am. I'll post it in the chat box. Okay. Okay, thank you for your wonderful presentation, ma'am. Thank you. I'll stop sharing the screen. Yes, I'm sharing the screen. My screen sharing has ended, right? Yeah, you have ended the screen sharing, ma'am. And I'm sharing you your certificate of appreciation, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am, for your valuable time, spending your time over here, ma'am. No problem. Also, uh, can would I will it be fine if I can leave the presentation? It's twelve uh, o'clock at night for me. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 